Um, first of all, Edinburgh is my favourite city in the whole world as well. I don't actually live in Edinburgh. Uh, I live in Glasgow, and for those of you from Scotland, you'll be aware that there's a kind of west-east divide, but it's a wonderful city, absolutely wonderful city, both to, to go and visit, but also to work with in terms of the council. My, um, suppose I've been where you are at the moment, sitting there as a delegate, listening to speakers at these type of events on numerous occasions. I suppose the overriding feeling that I've come away with on a number of occasions is that it just all seems too good in that organisation. Yeah, it's very flowery. Everything seems to be rosy in the garden. And on the occasion we've actually followed up those speakers' talks and gone to the organisations and drilled down into the organisation, the actual reality is somewhat different from what I heard. <coughs> You're not going to hear that from me, folks. You're going to hear a what's and all account of what our experience has been. Have we got it right? Absolutely not. Have we made mistakes? Most definitely. Have we improved things? Definitely. But we've still got a hell of a long way to go. Um, I, as I said up there, development manager in the City of Edinburgh Council. I've only been in the council for just over two years. Prior to that, private sector experience, very fast moving organisation. So as you can imagine, moving from private sector and that type of organisation to the public sector and the local authority in particular, it's been a bit of a culture shock. Um, what I'd like to do today is very quickly, and it's, it's 20 minutes folks, you can only get a snapshot of some of the stuff that we have done. If you're interested, at the end of the presentation, I'm more than happy to talk to you and give you more detail. If you want to take me out and buy me a glass of champagne, I'm even more happier to do that. <clears throat> and if you want to follow up through telephone or email, feel free to do so. So I'm going to give you something quick on Edinburgh as a city, the services that we provide as a council. Where were we? What development activities did we put in place? Where are we now? And what are the future challenges that we're facing? So very, very briefly, big council, 21,000 employees, not the biggest by far in the UK. When you think of Birmingham Council, it's 70,000 employees, but we are a large council. We've got a lot of employees, wide diversity in terms of the tasks that are carried out, as you can imagine to provide these services, education, social work, housing, culture and leisure. Quick show of hands, how many of you have been in Edinburgh? Fabulous. And I'm assuming you all love it. Yeah? It is a wonderful city. It's actually been voted the best place to live in the UK, four years running, uh, by some well-renowned publications. So, great city, good organisation to work for. <clears throat> Where were we? I was kind of parachuted into this organisation because there was a number of inconsistencies in how we approached both managing performance of individuals and also identifying and delivering learning and development. Because we're such a large organisation, very diverse organisation, <coughs> we had education, we were along to themselves, we also had housing and social work and so on and so forth. And each of those departments were very territorial and very protective of what they had done and as a result, they had their own competency frameworks. They had their own performance management schemes that they were very protective of. The result of that across the organization is that where it happened, it was differing in terms of its quality. Some areas, it just wasn't happening at all. We were on the receiving end of some very, very negative feedback from staff through our staff attitude surveys. <coughs> We were recognised as investors and people as an organisation in 19, or 2005, sorry. Um, but if nothing had been done at that time two years ago, we would have lost recognition without a shadow of a doubt. And investors and people, this is coming up, actually a previous investors and people assessor, really only gets you to the starting line in terms of learning and development. It's not best practice by any manner of means. So something had to give, something had to be done. And the majority of training it was delivered was very traditional classroom based. And if it ain't in a classroom, it ain't training. And that was the mindset, the prevalent mindset in the organisation. So what did we have to do? To ensure some sort of consistency, consistency rather of approach, um, we worked at I suppose, the highest level of the organisation, looking at our strategy, looking at our vision, our mission and our values. Yeah? What did they actually mean? How could we bring them to life? How could we ensure people were complying with those and actually demonstrating the values that we expected of them? 
and ensure that people had a clear understanding of what was expected of them. That was one of the biggest pieces of negative feedback that we had. People just un didn't understand what was expected of them. And in the worst case, some people didn't know why they were doing what they were doing. They didn't know how it linked into the organization and what the organization was actually achieving from it. So, significant piece of work, very significant piece of work to develop a single competency framework. <clears throat> and I can't in the time I've got to show you the detail of that, but it was, Nigel mentioned about engaging with your stakeholders. The stakeholders, we call them the movers and shakers in the organization. Who are the people that are in a position of influence that you can actually create a good working relationship with and milk that relationship for everything it's worth, to be honest with you, and I'll be quite honest, that's what we've done. Some of the techniques that we used was rep grid and critical incident. We built the competency framework from within. It would have been easy for me to go to WH Smith and buy a book in competency frameworks and cut and paste something. But because it's such a huge organization, because it was so important that what we developed and created represented what was going on in our organization, we had to build it from within. We had to engage the trade unions in the process. Trade unions, it's a negotiable, sorry, performance management is a negotiable item with the trade unions. And even more so now because we're now looking to link it directly to reward. So we had to involve those groups and just to validate what we had come up with from focus groups throughout the organisation. <coughs> what we now have, one competency framework, nine competencies, typically what you would expect in a competency framework, and the only difference from generic competency frameworks is we get something that is specific to our organisation, I believe, and local authorities, is political sensitivity. That's in there. It's hugely important to our organisation. It drives everything we do, both managing the internal politics and the external politics. Within each of those competencies, the nine competencies, we have four levels. Level one is for all staff. Level two, first line managers. Level three, middle managers. Level four, senior managers. And each of the competencies is profiled dependent on the level you are in the organization. We've not taken it to its extreme and profiled every single role. That's too huge a task for us, folks, and the benefit would be negligible. <coughs> Strategic alignment, what we call strategic alignment in our, our organization is the golden thread. How do we thread the strategic objectives through the organization? And we have four key strategic imperatives in our organization at the moment. Things like commercial sensitivity, absolutely crucial that we're getting the best deal we can as an organization. So how do we thread that through the organization? We use the performance management framework, the PRD system that's referred to up there, and we cascade those strategic imperatives throughout the organization. Now, I'm not saying it's working everywhere. If I go out and speak to someone digging, digging a hole in Princess Street and ask him why he's doing what he's doing, what it links to, it's not going to happen. You know, it's not going to happen. But we have made significant improvement. That kind of covers, I suppose, the ensuring that people had a clear understanding of what we expected of them and we measured it more consistently and more effectively. <coughs> but the important piece for me being a learning and development person, is how do we identify and deliver learning and development? And we have to be more structured in doing that. I said earlier on, the vast majority, in fact, all of the training that took place in the council two years ago was classroom-based. Hugely expensive and hugely ineffective, to be honest with you. And we'd be expected putting someone on an influencing skills course, putting them in a classroom for two days, and releasing them back into the workplace to be a changed animal. It just ain't going to happen. So we had to, I suppose, be a bit more scientific about it. And I'm a great believer that the knowledge and understanding piece can be done using technology. We can provide that to people who have got access to a PC. We've got 11,000 people in our organization who have direct access to a PC. So we had to, again, milk that opportunity. We identified a partner to work with us and develop a learning management system. <coughs> Critical things for us was that the learning management system was bespoke. It was mapped to our own competency framework. Everything that we do from a learning and development perspective is anchored in our competency framework. So for every learning and development activity, people know the direct link to the competencies within the organization that that learning activity is affecting. Absolutely critical that we identified a partner to help us do that and shape and create that. <clears throat> and thankfully, we have done that. 
We have developed our LMS, what we call launch and track, and our partners call launch and track technology, which means we can launch programs to individuals, we can launch programs to groups, we can launch programs to the organization, and we can track, which is absolutely hugely important for us, we can track who's doing it, particularly for things like statutory and regulatory and mandatory training. We can track that at the press of a button. Technology is phenomenal and it allows us to do that. And the guy who's, who developed it is sitting up the back there <coughs> and he's heard me saying consistently, we have to get the technology to work for its money. Yeah? Take the human aspect out of it and get the technology to work for it. That's what, we look, that's what our LMS looks like. It's a kind of screen dump. And you can see we've got competency related. We're out our nine competencies. Click on that button and it takes you on a whole range of activities, resources. We've got health and safety, we've got project management, we've got um, Prince 2 type stuff in there, we've got Association of Pro Project Management Introductory Certificate. Personal development it ranges from languages for life through to understanding the highway code. The reason we put those type of things in, I'll be quite honest with you, was a carrot to hook people into this and get them in and start to get generate some interest. My people in my HR, <coughs> we implemented a new EHR system, which has resulted in every single member of staff who's got access to a PC being able to do self-service. And what we mean by that, update their own personal records, um, put uh, expenses claim forms through, put holiday requests through. The whole idea behind that was to take the transactional aspect away from the HR function and allow us to focus on the higher value added activities. We, developed, we costed that out to do it in a classroom and deliver it out. We were talking in the region about half a million pounds to deliver that classroom training to those 11,000 users. We have worked closely, very closely with our partners to develop the content. Same partners who developed the LMS, by the way. Um, that content was developed and a comparative analysis, we're looking at £450,000 saving on that. And that is there, it's current, it's on tap. People can tap in at any time. Technology that's used is show me, try it. System shows you how to do it and then it lets you try it. Fabulous technology. And computer skills, we've got things like ECDL, computer driving license. That's there as a standard and all the Microsoft packages are there. Um, that's all about bespoke content or sorry, generic content. <clears throat> in an ideal world, all of the content that's mapped to your competency framework would have the City of Edinburgh Council stamped all over it, yeah, and it would be bespoke to our organisation. The reality is that, A, we don't have the time to do that, and B, we certainly don't have the money. And contrary to what a lot of people think, local authorities are struggling just as much as any other organisation at the moment to justify investment in this type of activity. So we have got our own content authoring tool that allows us to create content. And we have developed a, a program that supports our PRD, our performance management scheme, that's probably one of the most popular programs that's accessed by people on this. So there you are, that's our, our actual competence framework and the resources that are available for each of the competence areas. So nine competencies there, you can see political sensitivity that I made reference to there. Click on that and it takes you into a whole range of resources. I have to say at this moment in time, <coughs> that when we started this out, my, I suppose, whole reason for doing this was to create a path to appropriate resources for individuals. So leadership, people are assessing their leadership skills, and they go on to Google and do a search on leadership, they get five million returns back. So where did they start? I'm trying to create a narrow path that takes people to the most appropriate resources. I said I was going to tell you what's and all. Here it is. We've not got that right. We've got far too many resources in here. Far too many. So we're going to have to slim that down and ensure that we are, I suppose, allowing people to access the most appropriate and relevant and value-adding resources. <coughs> what we've also developed is a 360 feedback tool mapped to your own competency framework, online, part of the learning management system. And again, the great benefit of the partnership we've had is that we are working. What we bring to it is, that, I suppose, the practical aspects of applying this, and our partners bring the, the technology aspect to it, worked and brought this thing to market, and it's proven hugely beneficial. We've launched that and used that on our talent pool at the moment. The view moving forward is it will be optional for everyone if they want to engage in it. It won't be mandatory. But again, 
huge benefits from that. <coughs> and again, to get this whole thing happening, significant investment in publicity and marketing. So where are we at the moment? We've got consistent application of our performance review scheme. Um, when I say consistent application, it's been applied. Everyone's doing it. There's differing levels in terms of the quality of that, folks. It's some areas it's going really well, and other areas that it's still a kind of tick the box exercise. And that's where we have to focus our energy and attention. <coughs> we now have a blended approach. A number of our learning and development activities are made up of e-learning, some classroom. Using the classroom, what I believe it should be used for is to practice skills in a safe, controlled environment. It's not to provide people with knowledge and understanding. It's to practice skills, and that's what we're trying to do. And then back at the job, providing some sort of coaching support to people. We've got around 350 uh, programs at the moment. 24-7 access, any place, anywhere, any time people can access this. And that allows people who don't have a PC at work to access it from home. So everyone's got access. We've got 8,000 registered users at the moment. We've had this in operation for 14 months. There's 11,000 people in the council get access to a PC. We've got 8,000. Now, I suppose that, that doesn't mean anything. You've got 8,000 users, 8,000 registered people on it. The important thing for me is it's users. People are actually using this, and we're, I suppose, gaining enormous benefits in terms of the financial aspects of that, the reduction in costs, but the feedback that we've had from people. I've already mentioned some of the financial benefits we've had on EHR. We also do PRINCE2. <coughs> we have had a, a comparative analysis to classroom to e-learning. We've had 100% 100 success. 325 people we've put through PRINCE2. I tested at the end of it, 100% success. If we had done that in a classroom, 2,000% saving delivering it through e-learning. We do have some cultural challenges. There are still the, the dinosaurs in the organization who still believe that training only happens in the classroom. And we're continuing to, I suppose, face off to those barriers to effectiveness. So that continues with us, and that's going to be ongoing. And to be honest with you, I don't see any end to that in the moment. The lessons that we've learned, don't underestimate the time it takes. It takes a hell of a lot of time and a hell of a lot of energy to get this thing up and running. Socialize your thoughts and your ideas with your key stakeholders, your movers and shakers in the organization. And more importantly, I suppose get an idea who your supporters are, but more importantly, know where your exosets are coming from that will allow you to position yourself to defend those exosets. Have a clear focus on stakeholder engagement. I think it's absolutely important that we do that. We have to engage with the business, the movers and shakers. There's no silver bullet in this. And that's one of the lessons that I learned. I wish I knew 10 years ago that there's no silver bullet. You have to create something that is right for your own organization. By all means, look around, see what other organizations are doing, but don't automatically think you can cut and paste that into your organization. It ain't going to work. My approach is to adapt, adopt, and improve. That's what we've done with that. Learn from best practice. And where we're going in the future, we need to do a hell of a lot more work in measurement. How do we measure the value of our learning and development activities and our performance management activities? Talent management is huge for us at the moment in the organization. Um, <clears throat> we are probably at the forefront of local authorities, certainly in Scotland, in terms of what we're doing with talent management. And the whole idea behind that is to unearth the latent talent in the organization and develop it and retain it. It's difficult retaining really talented people in local authorities because there's an attraction in the private sector, or there was the attraction in the private sector. So it's difficult to retain them. So we're looking at talent management, we're looking at using technology to support that. We're looking at online performance management, again, using our LMS to support that. That'll move, that'll certainly move, and I know that our partners, who Brightwave, who are <coughs> um, on the exhibition down there, if any of you get an opportunity, speak to Brightwave, absolutely fabulous organization, most flexible organization I've come across, and very creative and innovative. And finally, keep it fresh. Yeah? Continually redo it, reshape it, remake it and keep it fresh and communicate, communicate, communicate with your people. So hopefully I've given you an overview of, of where we've been in the organization. 
all the nuts and bolts. I've not given you all the nuts and bolts in the time that's there. But if you want, then please feel free to speak to me afterwards um, or email me. And if you want to see our learning management system, I'm sure we could provide you with access for that. Okay, thank you.